Today's episode of The Compendium was sponsored by Critical Dice. Stick around for a special offer at the end of the show. Welcome to The Compendium, a resource designed to help you spend less time learning D&D and more time actually playing. Thank you for joining us this week on The Compendium. Unfortunately, this episode might only be half as good as other episodes are. I don't know what you think. (laughs) No. (laughs) It may not measure up. I'm I'm trying to think of good half puns here because this week we are talking about half elves. It's our first foray into half races, which I'm excited about because I think there is, beyond just the race itself, some stuff to unpack with the idea of, of running a half race. Um, and so let's go ahead and dive into it. And first of all, let's talk a little bit about why we decided to start with half elves. I mean, first, one of the things is because we've already talked about elves. So that right. makes things a little clearer to begin with. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think we started with half elves because they're the best. I mean, just demonstrably, they're the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're only know. half as good as real elves? No. No. It's not, <laughs> no. It's not that they're half as good, it's that they're twice as good. It's not divisive, it's multiplicative. It's uh, they get the best of both worlds. They get the best of their human uh, parent and the best of their elven parent. Um, uh, Cause like, you know, they don't live. S- What's really cool about half elves is that they have the ambition and wonderlust and uh, kind of inquisitive nature of humans um but they have also like the refined senses and the love of like art and doing things well even if it takes a long time and the connection to nature in the Feywild of the elves so they have both of those things kind of put together but it's not without its drawbacks but both lore wise and mechanically speaking they are probably one of my favorite races because of that it's they're, they're pretty great so have half races always been around since the first iteration of D&D, or was this something that was introduced a little bit later on in the timeline? I feel like if it wasn't from the very beginning, it was pretty early on, because okay. I feel like half elves have been around for a long time, and there were some other half races back in the day that didn't really like make it to the present. Uh, so yeah, I'm just going to say it. So there used to be a half elf, half dwarf race. And they had a beautiful, wonderful name. They were called a Dwelf. Or if there was a group of them, they were Dwelves. You didn't have 12 Dwelves. I feel like, you know how like a, a bunch of, what is it, ravens or crows are called a murder? I feel like Dwelfs need their own bizarre acronyms for like a gaggle of that, or like something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they'd be, they'd be called an awkward of Dwelves. There you go. That is such a weird combo. Like, I feel like they're so counterintuitive. I yeah. love it, but it's just funny when you think about that. So dwells really have is. been around for quite a long time. So half races are not necessarily something new, uh, but they are limited, right? So there's only a couple of different half races that are like canon within the guides. Most of them that are presented are full races, like tieflings, dragonborns, humans. They're not necessarily split the same way. Right. I mean, I I think in the player's handbook, it's just half orcs and half elves. Um, Although I I think there's some other things that kind of come out like later, like if you think about like Asimar and Genasi um, and even um, the uh, Goliaths. So they're like half giants, um, Mm -hmm. half genies and uh, half angels uh, for the... um, Asimar as a kind of counterpoint to the tieflings. So they're they're in there. They're just not necessarily called that. And then, which I, I can't wait for us to do this. There's also all of like the half animalistic races, right? Oh so yeah, like the Tabaxi like the, and the and Ari- Aricroca, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, where they're just like something people. They're like lizard. <laughs> pe- they're like they're like lizard people or bird people or cat people, right? Uh, and then there's the the what is it not? Is it the shifter? Uh, from Eberron where they're mm. they can kind of like they're like half werewolves kind of almost you know or like half druid wild shape characters it's, it's kind of interesting so uh, I wonder yeah. why these half races got the title of like half elf why didn't they get their own name then because there are these other half like hybrid if you will hybrid races uh, that just have their own title 
I think it's interesting that, and, and maybe that's where my confusion came in, is because it's specifically titled a half elf, whereas these other races are not titled a half cat or <laughs> yeah. a half human, or I don't know, whatever way it would go. Well, maybe it's because uh, a couple of reasons. One is legacy. Like, this is what they've been called for a very long time, so they just kept it. Number two, they're half of another mortal race that is already sentient. Um, as opposed to, say, like an Eric Croco, where like a half bird, the imp- it's not implicit that it was another like humanoid sentient um, species or race. Uh, whereas with the orcs and the elves, it is. Um, and uh, so I think that's part of it, too. And then also they were made back when they were bad at naming things and all the newer <laughs> ones have good names. Um because all this came out in later in later editions and later books. I mean, that it's the same reason why they're poisonous snakes, not venomous snakes in the Monster Manual. So, but poisonous means that they're dangerous to touch, but they're not. They're dangerous when they bite you. That's called venom. Anyway, so they just, you know, they get, they get it wrong sometimes. Uh, but I, I think that's kind of why. It's just, it's just a legacy thing. Uh, so let's dive into some of the nitty gritty about half elves and what makes them so unique. And, and I mean, again, on the surface, you hear half and you think that, um, it's going to be worse because you only get part of something, right? Yeah. But it's not, it doesn't actually turn out that way. You might actually want to play a half elf instead of a full elf, depending on what you're looking for in a character. Yeah, and I almost always do because they make great bards as well. So, you know, unsurprisingly, I'm a little biased. But um, the first thing you have to know about the half-elves is much like um, halflings and even gnomes uh, in the player's handbook or even tieflings, they don't come from large kingdoms or dynasties or like a big, uh, you know, nation of all half-elves because of their dual nature of typically having a uh, human parent and an elven parent they are the half breeds of other things. And so they're going to pop up um, in human settlements and kingdoms and elven uh, hu- uh, settlements and kingdoms. So uh, they are kind of just a mix of those things. And what's really interesting is they're, they're kind of like, have you ever read the kid's story, The Pig Who Could Fly? Mm-hmm. Right. So he's not welcome in the sty and he's not welcome in the yeah. nest. Right. And that's kind of the half, the half elves is just like that, where when they grow up in elven uh, kingdoms, uh, it starts out OK, but they mature a lot faster than their full elven uh, counterparts. And so they're ready to go out and like, you know, rule the world. And their their friends they grew up with kind of stayed kids. But they also don't live as long as the elves do. And so they like, well, I want to go and do stuff. And so they're a little malcontent. And, but if they, ones that grow up in the human realms, they grow up just fine with their human counterparts, but they can watch multiple generations of friends and loved ones pass away while they are barely touched by the rigors of time. And so it can be kind of lonely. Um, and also, while they have the ambition and inventiveness of the humans, it's tempered, it's a bit more refined, and so they may find it a little uncouth in the ambitions and imaginings of their full human um, you know, compatriots. And so there's always going to be this pull to the other side, the grass is always greener kind of idea, but they're never truly welcome um, in either one. But that being said... <sighs> In my mind, the way that they're built mechanically would make them almost as everyone's second best friends, like how the humans are described, even more so because they have that high charisma. They're so good at everything, and they could kind of get along with everybody. But the book does describe them being a bit more ostracized, like they would never really ever be truly welcome in an elven kingdom and they would never truly be satisfied in a human kingdom and so there is this these stupendous gifts that come from being a half elf but there's always going to be this undercurrent of discontent Mm -hmm. like that just feeling like you never really belong anywhere uh i like in the in the um the player's handbook that it it starts off by basically talking about that that divide that they walk yeah. on by saying that to humans half elves look like elves and to elves they look like humans right and so no matter where you go you're not necessarily 
and that's the thing too, is like what strikes me there is not only that walking that divide, but um, you're always kind of being judged about what your appearance looks like. You're not just being like, oh, you're just a you. It's like, oh, you look like a human or, oh, you look like an elf. Um, I don't know. I, that's just really, that really strikes me. No, absolutely. So like my mom is from Minnesota and, but she married my dad and they moved to South Carolina where my dad's from. And um, when her family would call or visit, they would always say what a horrible accent she had picked up. But everyone that she encountered in the South called her a Yankee because the, all they could hear was that Northern Minnesota, oh yeah, don't you know, uh, thing going on. And so she was also in a similar way, just never truly of any of the worlds, even though I didn't think she sounded Southern, nor did I think she sounded like, you know, a Minnesotan. Uh, but it's just, that's just kind of the, 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 the trade-off that you get. So I, I can easily understand how that would be. So would you say that half elves, and this is going to be kind of a weird question, but out of curiosity, are, would you say that they're all they're usually first generation half elves, or well, or are they like generational, where this is like the tenth generation of mom and dad were both half elves versus right. mom was an elf and dad was a human, or vice versa? I think it is more common that they end up being the offspring of one of each, but it is also possible for them to have two half elf parents. Um, I feel like that's not as common, but depending on the world you're playing and who knows, but that's kind of how it's presented in the player's handbook. But just like you can have a Labradoodle by having a Labrador and a Poodle be the sires, but you also could have a whole, you know, um, lineage of Labradoodles that have always been Labradoodles. Well, you know, what's funny weird that you bring up, it, but. no, it's funny that you bring that up because uh, I actually, I, I mean, I think I've told you this. I used to be a dog trainer. Um, in one of or my stories. Yeah. And uh, what's interesting about Labradoodles or the like doodle mm-hmm. breeds is that it's usually only second or third generation where you get the hypoallergenic feature, which is what most people mm-hmm. buy them for is that poodles, people right. that are allergic to dogs aren't allergic to them. So that's actually what made me think of it is like, is there some kind of lineage change or something that occurs in like the fourth, fifth, sixth, tenth generation? Or is it something that it only occurs in this first generation and maybe ends up like kind of dissipating down the line or like, you know, how does that that situation work so that's funny yeah, no, you brought that up as the example because that's kind of where my mind was anyways yeah. and, and we have a yorkapoo so it's the same kind of thing so maybe that's why it's on my mind but yeah that'd be really interesting to, and to see how those genetic traits ebb and flow over the generations and i mean that means it is possible to have an entire extended family and generations and lines of half elves that could potentially become a na- a tribe a nation a kingdom you mm-hmm. know so I-, I would love to see that kind of thing and uh, it would make a lot of sense if they don't feel like they belong anywhere mm-hmm. right right yeah to find others like them to to kind of commiserate with and someone perhaps, else understands me right exactly and perhaps that's one of the hooks that a person could use when saying okay well why is my character my half elf why are they an mm-hmm. adventurer is because there's an element of feeling like you're from the land of misfit toys. And so you find a bunch of other land of misfit toys, you know, a, 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 um, a John in the box instead of a Jack in the box, you know, a doll that doesn't work quite right. And, and that kind of stuff where you're like, okay, well, this is a dragon born who's lost his honor. Uh, this is a, you know, a gnome who doesn't like building things. And this halfling's awfully violent. He's our barbarian. Like, so no one here like works the way they're supposed to. And I find oddly, a kinship with these 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 leftovers, these gurus, and they're my found family. And that's always a nice uh, trope to have in those kinds of adventures, the found family trope. So before we move on to uh, diving, just, I mean, we've already started to, to brush the surface of like culture and whatnot, but before we kind of move to that segment, there is one thing that I want to dialogue with you about, which is that I think the understanding is that when you've got a half something, the other half is human. Yes. yes and th- that is the conceit. I don't like th- that. I don't know why, but that bothers me. It's like, why? Why does it have to be human? Why does it assumption that human is? I mean, especially because humans are like the odd ones out. They're the the newest people in this in this world. And so I feel like if you're going to have a half, it would be from an older race that has actually been around longer. 
So let's unpack what that is. And then also I'd like to get your thoughts on what if you want to play something that's a half elf, but the other half isn't human. What would you do or what would you recommend for a player or a DM to discuss about that? Yeah, absolutely. And I hear your point about maybe one of the older races, but I, I think that's actually a good argument for the other side, why it, it is most commonly humans, because humans are the newer kids on the block in most of these worlds, and they're the most adaptable, right? They're the ones that can pivot and shift and change with what's going on. And so it would make sense to me in my mind that, oh, okay, well, they're the ones who are the most compatible with a tiefling or with, um, you know, uh, with the elves or the dwarves or the halflings or whatever, that perhaps they don't talk about it in this way, but their genetic code has the most similarities of all the other things. Um, it's, it, it just, for me, that makes the most sense because there's not something so strong presenting like a tiefling's red skin and horns and innate magic ability or the innate luck or fire breathing of a, you know, of a, of a dragonborn that's going to really clash with the essence of a fey touch creature like an elf. Whereas with humans, you have a very blank slate. There's not going to be a lot of genetic conflicts um, or uh, attribute conflicts. And so I, I can see why that would be that way. Um, but as far as like making your own, like we, we joked before about the dwarves, and, um, and even in the Tolkien lore, the, the hobbits, halflings, uh, they say descended from men. Now in D&D, they don't do that, but it's, it, it, there's a little nod that, that there is something going on with the halflings as well. Um, I would say is this, is you just kind of think about what is the theme of that race and then find ways to incorporate the two themes you're doing. And so just like how the player's handbooks talks about the half elves as being the best of both of their parentages of the adaptability, ambition and ingenuity of humans, that's the theme. And then the love of art and uh, the keen senses being the theme for the elves, you mix those two things together. And when we get into the stats, you'll kind of see that being brought out. Um, whereas if you wanted to do something like a tiefling dragonborn, I love that because you've got the theme there is like, say, like innate magic, right? And them being created by something uh, that is not quite a god, perhaps, but something very old and very powerful. Those are very similar themes. And so especially if you're going with, you know, red dragon or gold dragon or something uh, where you've got the fire element going on, then you have it with the tieflings as well as their kind of stock uh, configuration, I could see those things kind of coming together that uh, they would keep their infernal legacy or elements of it. Perhaps they would gain the fire breathing um, as well, but um, maybe the flavor there is that the red skin has just like a hints of scales, but not true scales. And uh, perhaps the, the they face... have a tail. Mm, oh, <laughs> they would totally have a tail. <laughs> There's a way to give your tiefling a tail folks. Mm -hmm, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah exactly and i would love that and because they both are prone to having kind of like like tieflings have horns dragonborns have like the the hint of horns it's almost like that crest you see around like a bearded dragon or 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 some of the different kind of lizards in our world where the skull shape may be more humanoid and less dragon shaped but like maybe the horns are more pronounced or there's instead of hair it's just a, a, like a field of short stubby uh, proto horns along with the two large prominent ones on the top i would see that very easily and i i really like that I, i've played with someone who made a homebrew uh race of uh half tiefling half dragonborn which i thought was really cool I like that. Um, yeah, I think another reason why the idea of like why human is like so predominant, I think it, it twinges back to that conversation we had in our, our very first discussion into um, the topic of race and the, the idea of our races racist, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And just like making the assumption that, oh, well, it's obviously it's human. Um, and so I think like that's definitely forefront on my mind. And mm -hmm. I think it's important too, as a player to understand that there's like a, a conscious reason there and it's not just because, well, of course humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah, I like that. And that's the thing is that, uh, we talked about this at the very beginning in this whole kind of like arc talking about the races is that it, race in our world is misidentified because we're all human, but we like to divide ourselves up uh, for good or for ill, typically for ill, um, but we're all the same 
species. We're all the same thing. We just have some very slightly different characteristics. Right. Whereas in D&D, these are really very different, different <laughs> things. That's a bird man and that's an orc. Come on. They're not even close, right? Uh, dragonborns are reptilian and the tieflings are demonic. And then the elves, they're from the Fae. They're, they're not even considered to be humanoids. They're like, not from around here. No, they ain't. Um, <laughs> but so it really is different. And so I've actually seen worlds on like podcasts and things where they don't have half races because they're just like, no, these are different kinds of creatures and they're just not, and they're just mutually exclusive. The, the genetics don't work that way. Um, there can be relationships, uh, marriages, all that kind of stuff, but it's just never going to produce a offspring. Um, like, uh, what is it? Donkeys and horses, they make mules, but then mules can't breed with any of the other things. So it just doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a weird example, I know, but um, <laughs> we're full of weird examples in this episode. Let's yeah, just let's, keep going with it. Let's let, own let's, it. Yeah, let's just go for broke. Lean into it. I don't want to. I'm scared. Um, so yes, I mean it, it's just it's just very interesting when you think about all these things. But the goal of D and D, as always, is to have fun. And if you like doing this kind of like hot swapping with characteristics and thinking up the lore that would make those things make sense. Is that fun to you? Go for it. I love the homebrew stuff that people come up with because it's always very, very interesting and just makes for great storytelling. So as always do what you want, but here's what it says in the books is kind right. of the idea. So we already talked a little bit about the fact that, uh, uh, I mean, as written uh half elves don't necessarily have a a community mm -hmm. um or a kingdom or tribe or any of these other kind of clans that we've discussed as some of the other races might have um they're a little bit more of what would be considered like a gypsy or a wanderer yeah would you say yeah i can see that um now i mean that's not to say that they don't have a home nation they absolutely would um you know because uh, the uh, player's handbook even talks about how the naming conventions can be anything from the human or from the elven side. And hilariously says, if they grew up in a human civilization, they're more likely to pick an elven name. If they grew up in an elven civilization, they're more likely to pick a human name because you're not my real dad. And they, they <laughs> want what they don't have, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, but it does end up making them loners, wanderers, um, or even trying to hide who they really are. Um, and trying to pass for full human among humans and avoiding high concentrations of elves since the elves can't get fooled that way very easily and the like. So it's, um, yeah, it, it can make for a very lonely existence, but in the same way, like we talked about with the gnomes, how the gnomes are typically going to be, you know, part of a human civilization, maybe a, a, a tutor for generations of a single family, that kind of thing. The half elves very easily could be, you know, trusted scouts or the collectors of, of bardic lore in a particular culture and find a home uh, over the decades and centuries uh, that way. So I, I can see it um, a lot of different ways. Would you say that half elf children tend to end up with one parent or the other? It would seem that way. And my gut is that they typically end up with the human side more because they're going to be more similar the longest. Mm -hmm. um, and when they do get that itch to like, you know, discover themselves, it's about the same time as the humans do too. And so it's a little less abrasive, perhaps. Um, although the the tension and the possible you know political intrigue that comes with having that one half uh, elf kid growing up in the high courts of an uh, elven dynasty is really fun too. But that, that's kind of my read on it. But you know, I've seen it. I've seen it both ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something else that the book says is that they're very good ambassadors or diplomats because mm -hmm. that's that's where we start to pull in why the half race can be so beneficial is because they get the grace of the elves but maybe a little bit less of the uh um i don't know the Rashness. yeah <laughs> like how would you describe us humans uh uh, of you know the human side and so you kind of got the best of both worlds and so they're you know they be they would be very good hostage negotiators right yeah. it's, you know you've got that kind of like in between where they're the ones helping countries or civilizations make treaties with each other um 
that kind well, of yeah, thing. Yeah, because they're the very embodiment of two different things coming together. Uh, so they would make great uh, ambassadors or emissaries, like you said, like hostage negotiation, which is awesome. I hadn't considered that where like they can empathize with wanting something you don't have, but willing to be going to great lengths to get it. They're like, yeah, no, I get that feeling. Let, let's talk about it. Um, so yeah, I love that. Um, it makes them unique in being the kinds of characters that want to bring two sides together because they are the living embodiment of two sides being put together. And we already kind of talked about why these these half elves would likely go adventuring, um, but there's so many story hooks there. I mean, if you're an adva- mm-hmm. ambassador, you're just on a trip to get from you know this town to that town to deliver the treaty. Um, if you're you grew up with your your human dad, you could be on a quest to meet your mom in the mm-hmm. Elven Kingdom. You could just be trying to find somewhere you feel like you belong. Um, there's so many different story hooks as to why a half elf would go out adventuring and join, like, probably eagerly join a party of adventurers. Oh yeah, absolutely. I um, mean, even it kind of name checks bards uh, in there as well. Um, uh, and even thieves where they can just kind of adapt to any situation. And so they can find their niche in wherever they find themselves. And uh, yeah, so, I mean, th- this one's probably the easiest one to figure out a set maybe for humans themselves of why they would go out adventuring. So let's dive into half elf traits. Let's talk about what makes these guys so cool to play. Let's do it. Um, everything. So, um, so Could you half- elaborate on that, please? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'd be happy to. Okay, so uh, for half elves, they get a ton of stuff, like almost as much as elves do. And elves have a huge list before they even get into sub races. Um, and so it's not surprising that the half elves would be the similar. Uh, so this is my favorite part about the half elves is the ability score increase. They get a plus two to the charisma, and then they get a plus one to two other ability scores of your choice. Does any other race get that many bumps to ability scores? Yes. I want to say there's a sub race of dwarves that does. I wow, that's say really niche. I mean, it you have is. to. Wow. Yeah. Because that's so a they, lot. Yeah, Normally it's, a, it's two, two, yeah, maybe three. Yeah, because dwarves get what? Plus two to constitution. And then uh, then I think it's the mountain dwarves that end up getting. Um, uh, yeah, so they get plus two to constitution and then they get a plus two to strength, I want to say as well so that's the closest one um uh, that has ended up getting four uh, so this is a kind of a big deal um and normally you would see this kind of thing happen where they get a big bump like this and then not a lot of extra stuff on top like that was the that was the big thing they mm-hmm. get like for humans they can get two they can get one to two different attributes um if they take the extra feet at the beginning or they can just get one to everything, which is, I mean, that's plus six all said, but it's not as impactful. But here, their abilities and special things just keep going. Um, but real quick, so the age for half elves is they reach adulthood around 20, like humans, but then live uh, to about 180. Uh, so pretty comparable to, say, like a halfling would. Um, uh, and then the alignment um typically have that chaotic bend like the elven heritage um again also humans do as well uh because of the love of freedom creative expression uh always looking for their place in the world so Mm -hmm. uh that would um and it makes a lot of sense too because think about them trying to fit in with elven society that has like you know everyone knows their role and there's long-standing traditions that are centuries or millennia old and they just don't fit into it and so they kind of would resent those rules and those traditions wanting to you know kind of buck that system um so uh for the size uh, half elves are about the same size as humans uh between five and six feet tall and their size of course is medium and a base speed of walking uh 30 feet uh, and then they have a couple cool more things here. They have dark vision. So they get to keep the dark vision from the elves uh, up to 60 feet as if in bright light and then total darkness as if it were dim light. And as always, uh, no color, just shades of gray. Um, and then they get fey ancestry. This is the big one. Uh, they uh, have advantage on saving throws against being charmed and magic can't put them to sleep, which begs the question, do they sleep? I think they do. They just can't be forced to be put to sleep. 
Yeah, because elves usually meditate, right, for their four-hour right. long rest, or right. their long rest is a four-hour meditation where they're like mm -hmm. semi-conscious. Right. So they have advantage against being charmed, and they can't go to sleep unless they want to, but they do actually sleep. Uh, so it's a, a, a somewhat muted version of that uh, feature with the elves, but it's still pretty powerful, mechanically speaking. And remind me again with charmed, is that just the um, actual, like, um, oh, what's it called? A charm person? Yes. Uh, uh, no, there are several. Charm mind... condition? Like, the there's charm... a condition, yes. that's what I'm thinking of. Is that, like, is it, what is it specific? Is it? It's it referring to the condition. Minute. But, okay. it, it, it's referring to the condition because a lot of those uh, mind altering or social spells are going to name check the charm condition in addition to whatever else the spell or feature does. And so here they have advantage against all of those spells that mention uh, the charm condition or are a charming effect. Um, and it'll usually call it out pretty obviously. Um, and then again, skill versatility. So again, going with this, this idea of best of both worlds, they gain proficiency in two skills of your choice, just whatever you want, uh, which is pretty awesome, uh, that adaptability. And then languages going along with the emissary or um, you know, being a, uh, a diplomat, they can uh, speak, read, and write common, elvish, and one extra language of your choice. So they just get a lot of really great things that aren't powerful by themselves, but they're powerful in their adaptability, which is again, my favorite thing in d and is adaptability. I rarely go hardcore into a single concept or idea. I like to keep my options open. I like the kind of Swiss army knife uh, vibe that a lot of characters can have, like, you know, Dr. Stranger Iron Man does. Um, and so this only adds to that. And then when you put that along with, you know, bards that get even more, um, skills and then expertise and all this other stuff it's it's pretty great and that is it for the player's handbook half elf if you are playing just a you don't get like a sub race option as a half elf in the player's handbook however we are however. going to refer back to our new best friend book which is the sword coast it's adventures adventures guide yeah uh, which i finally had to buy because we were referencing it so much that i'm like all right that's it i got to have this book um, where there are some variations of half elves that you can play um, if you're wanting something a little bit more niche or unique yes and so what's interesting with the sub races What's happening here, lore-wise, is they're assuming that the kind of elf that uh, one of your progenitors was, wasn't just elf, because there's lots of different kinds of elves. Mm -hmm. And so what they do here is very much like what we did with the tieflings, where you don't just add stuff, you swap out some default things for some specialized things. And so for all of these that are in the uh, Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, what you do is you take the skill versatility, uh, the part that lets you gain two, uh, proficiency with two skills of your choice, and take that out and instead add this new feature. Um, and there are uh, four uh, main ones. Um, oftentimes D&D Beyond will reference like the Mark of Detection Half-Elf, Mark of Storm Half-Elf. Those aren't sub races in the sense but mechanically they work like that because of the dragon mark from eberron so we don't include those so if you're looking through dd and beyond and you're like well wait there's two, there's two more here that's why it's not really a sub race it's just an extra feature that has a similar mechanic so the computer program and algorithm kind of uses it that same way um so the first one is the aquatic elf uh, very straightforward you let go of skill versatility, and instead you get to have a swimming speed of 30 feet. Um, so walking feet, walking speed is 30, and you also have a swim speed of 30. Right, and normally your swim speed gets cut in half if you don't have a swim speed. So this is kind of great. And now notice it doesn't say that you can breathe underwater or anything or talk to the fishes, uh, but you can't swim with the fishes. Um, and uh, maybe that's because you have kind of like little webbed uh, stuff between your uh, fingers and toes, something like that, but that's that's really all that one does. So if you were a half elf with a gnome instead of a human and you had speak with small animals, do you think you could speak with the fishes? Yes, but only small ones. <laughs> a little guppy. Swim yeah, little away. guppies. Swim away. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the um you, you talk to like the seahorses and that kind of stuff. Yeah. That'd be pretty awesome. 
uh, I'm getting Dr. Doolittle vibes now again. All right. Um, then, very interestingly, there's the Drow Half Elf, which is actually maybe the most powerful option here because you get you let go of that skill versatility and you get the Drow's magic. Um, so you know Dancing Lights as a cantrip. Uh, you get Fairy Fire um, at third level and then Darkness at fifth level. So just like how the Drow have innate spell casting that levels up with the character from the race, not the class, um, you get that here. And so you give up some skills to gain innate magic uh, that you can use. Uh, and again, as always, Charisma is the spell casting ability for those. Um, and then uh, we've got the high half elf. Um, and I'm going to avoid making the obvious joke there, but uh, <laughs> the <laughs> the basically they get rid of the skill versatility. Instead, they choose the uh, high elf's uh, weapon training or cantrip. Uh, so uh, the high elves they get uh, weapon training, so that they're innate. I think they're innately good with uh, the what is it? Long sword, short sword, long bow, short bow. And they also can pick a, uh, a cantrip from the wizard uh, spell list. Here, you can do either or, but not both. Right? So that's kind of interesting. But there you go. Like, you get all cantrip. Whereas with the drow magic, you get, like, a cantrip and then two other spells, which is kind of awesome. And then the last one is uh, the uh, wood half-elf variant. Uh, where they like go with the skill versatility and said they can either choose the elf weapon training, fleet of foot, or mask of the wild. So there's three options, but you can't choose all of them. So mask of the wild lets you help helps you to hide uh, kind of in plain sight in natural surroundings. Fleet of foot lets you move a little bit faster. And then there's the elf weapon training from before. And then the, just to clarify too, in the Sword Coast Adventures, there's the moon elf and the sun elf. Right, so that's other names for Wood Elf and High Elf. Okay. Is it? Well, it's got the Wood Elf in here, and then it's got the Moon Elf or Sun Elf Descendant, which is the High Elf's Elf Weapon right. Training or Cantrip. So, so basically, it's either, it, it doesn't make a difference. It's just for flavor if you're a Moon mm -hmm. Elf or a Sun Elf. Right, and back in the day, those were kind of the two big distinctions of subraces of elves was the sun and moon elf or the gold and silver elves, or if you're being nasty, the gold and dross elves, um, which is just really mean. Uh, and that was kind of an early D&D &D delineation between like the high elves of magic and kingdoms versus like the, uh, the, the Mirkwood style elves that are nature and... Uh, and forests and things uh but we've kind of let that go a lot in the newer editions so that I, I see why the distinction's there so understanding everything you can do with a half elf um what i mean you already mentioned bard but what are some of your favorite ways to play a half elf or what do you think that they really lend themselves to naturally with all of these different benefits that they get Right. So, I mean, there's a lot uh, that naturally lend, especially when you consider that uh, for most of the spell casters in D&D, &D, both divine and arcane, the most common uh, attribute for the spell casting is going to be charisma because warlock and sorcerer and bard on the arcane side all mm -hmm. use charisma and then paladins uh, and I think it's just paladins on the, on the divine side. Uh, if I remember correctly. So out of like the eight spellcasting classes, like half of them use charisma. So all of those would be great options. Um, and if you look to with uh, Sorcerer, there's the wild magic origin uh, where they have a kind of innate t in, like attunement with the Fey wild, which is chaotic and, and random, uh, which make a lot of sense. And then you've even got the Fey uh, patron for the warlocks, which is pretty great to kind of go along with that. But I could also see how that malcontentness, that kind of just never having a place in this world uh, would lend a half elf character to um, strike an allegiance with some greater entity to become uh, a warlock uh, with her patron. Uh, same way with uh, a paladin where they have found a god. Maybe the elven gods have accepted them and they're like, if, look, if they can accept me, why can't you? But there's an element of, of anger there. And so smitey smite, they would choose to become a paladin. Um, for like, you know, to, to go 
the other side of the wine and cheese pairing that we always do too, uh, the things that would be kind of like a little outside the normal realm. Um, th- it's difficult because of that versatility with the skills and versatility. With two things with, that you want in anything, like two ability yeah. increases of anything you want. Exactly. Like, you could really make it work anywhere, but I don't think lore wise barbarian and perhaps artificer make as much sense and that would be really interesting because they could do it well i mean if they really did grow up in the wilds maybe they were adopted into a tribe of like goliaths or uh, half orcs too like they were like oh uh, this makes sense to me they become a barbarian or maybe they live in such a large kingdom that they you know sought tutelage underneath a uh, a gnome and learned uh the you know the arts of being an artificer so i haven't seen those as much but honestly they can really kind of slot into anywhere uh but there's definitely ones that kind of go with the grain more often than there are things that go against the grain when making those pairings so hopefully we've already dispelled these for most people but what are some of the common misunderstandings about this race that tend to potentially lean people away from playing one would you say Mm, the only thing i can think of because for Again, I'm biased because you, you start reading the half elf in the stats and you're like, wow, this is great. But I think maybe the way that we started this conversation was that they're only half as good, right? That there may be a prejudice or a misconception that, oh, I don't play half elves because if I wanted to be a half elf, I'd just be an elf, right? If I wanted to be a human, I would just be a human. They don't get that feet, then I really want that feet. And so not seeing the the really wonderful synergy that happens uh, with that lineage and the great things that it can do. I think that would be the only reason why someone might shy away, just not understanding the kind of strength of that. I think there's also a, a higher element of creativity needed for this Perhaps. race. It's not quite as plug and play or straightforward as some of the other ones where it's like, this is your community. These are your people. These are your rules you have to make a lot of that up for your backstory and kind of mm-hmm. where you came from or what you thought. And so it could, I guess, be a little intimidating for people that maybe aren't used to that process of character development or story development for their characters. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think going back to what we said at the very beginning of all of this, when we started with humans was that if you don't know what to do, just pick a human. Right. Uh, and we kind of recommend it to people. Don't start off your very first character as an elf, unless you really, really want to, because there's so much going on. I, I think that the half elves fall in that category as well. That there's, it's such a wonderful sandbox playground that if you're unsure or you're, um, intimidated by it just you'll, you'll get them next time get, get some you know log some hours with a different race and really dream up what you want to do before you jump into that kind of really really deep pool but it doesn't mean you can't it's just you know know what you're getting yourself into and everyone knows it's always good to have a backup character oh yeah <laughs> yeah just write junior on the end of that character sheet and keep going um <laughs> is that how we're ending no that was a stupid joke. Keep this in for the full episode. I protest. Thank you for listening to the compendium. I'm glad you're still here. You did me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you, you guys next hang- time. <laughs> you let me hang there. Oh my gosh. Thank you guys so much for joining us this week on The Compendium. This episode was sponsored by The Critical Dice and The Endless Bag of Dice, where you can get a new set of dice delivered to your door every single month for as little as $6.99. Compendium listeners get a special discount of 50% off of your first month's order by using the code COMPENDIUM at checkout. Just visit thecriticaldice.com and click on The Endless Bag of Dice to learn more. If you guys enjoyed watching in on our discussion today, make sure you subscribe to this channel and leave a comment below. We're pretty new to the video realm. We've been primarily an audio only podcast for our entire existence. And so that'll help us figure out if you guys want us to keep creating content to publish here on YouTube. Thanks so much for listening in. We appreciate you all and we will see you next time.